Thank you so much for joining us online today. We so appreciate you checking out this message. Uh, we hope you enjoy it and are inspired to live more and more like Jesus Christ by His grace. If you would like to support the ministries of Rancho, you can do so at rancho.tv slash giving. Set up a giving profile and a reoccurring gift. We'd sure appreciate that. Enjoy. Have you noticed that you carry around with you a lot of expectations? Unmet expectations, unspoken expectations, maybe even, if you're honest, some unrealistic expectations. We have expectations of ourselves, expectations of other people, expectations of our circumstances. And if we haven't noticed, we also carry around expectations of God. We are filled with expectations. Do you know who I think has the most expectations, though? Kids. Whether you're a parent or grandparents or a teacher or a babysitter, kids have a lot of expectations, don't they? I have three of them in my house. I have a sixth grader, a fourth grader, and a kindergartner, and every day I am inundated by their expectations. They have expectations about what kind of food I shop for. They have expectations about dinner. And where this gets really tricky is they have different expectations about dinner. And so every night, and dinner has to happen every day. I didn't know this until I became a mom and a wife. I don't need to eat three big meals a day. I'd be good with some popcorn for dinner, but no. Those kids and that husband of mine, they want dinner. And they want a different dinner than the other one. So it gets a little messy. The expectations. Uh, how many of you have ever babysat? You need to charge more money. Do not tell my babysitters that I said that, because they may be here. Those kids have expectations of these babysitters. When they show up, they have lists sometimes of all the things they want the babysitter to do with them. They have expectations. I had a moment recently, a couple of months ago, where I did not meet a very important and very realistic expectation of one of my kids. I got a text message in the middle of the workday from a mom friend of mine. In fact, this was my son Landon, who was in fourth grade, his friend Gavin's mom texted me. Did you follow that? Landon, friend, mom, okay? And so she texts me and I open up the text message and it's a picture. And I thought about showing you the picture today, but then I thought, I don't know if I can show pictures of other people's kids on the screen, so you're just gonna have to picture this in your mind with me. Three fourth grade boys standing together holding certificates. And Landon was in the middle. He had gotten an award at school that day, and I didn't know that it was happening. And this mom friend of mine was super kind and gracious, and I have to tell you, there was no judgment in her text. I really, really appreciated that because I was heaping it on myself. And I have to tell you, in the picture, I could see the other two fourth grade boys had pulled their masks down. This was when we were still wearing masks at school, and they had the biggest smiles on their faces. And my fourth grader, Landon, had kept his mask on, and I could tell by the look in his eyes that he was sad. I felt terrible. I did not know he was getting an award that day. Now, you may have heard me share a story about the fall where the same child called me in the middle of the school day and said, Mom, you're late picking me up. And I said, No, I'm not, buddy. School doesn't get out for two more hours. No, Mom, it got out early because it's parent-teacher conference week. I'm not very good at checking emails from the schools. There's two schools now that send me emails and I just can't keep track of all of it. So here I am again, not meeting an important expectation, a realistic expectation that this kid has of his mom. And so I go to pick kid up from school that day and I'm feeling awful and I know I have to take ownership of this and I have to make it up to him. And so I pick my kindergartner Abby up first every day and we stand and we wait for Landon in the same spot on the blacktop every single day. And Landon's making his way over. And do any of you know what the lean is? Yeah, I'm seeing some parents shake their head. This is when your kid gets too big and too cool to give you like a full-on hug. So they walk over and they do like a little lean and you get you know, a little side hug. Now I'm gonna take it because there's coming a day soon when this kid doesn't wanna give me a hug at all. So I'm gonna take the lean. So he walks over and he gives me the lean. 
And I look at him and I say, how are you doing, buddy? He looks up at me with those big blue eyes of his that he got from his dad. He didn't get them from me. And he says, I'm really disappointed in you. I know, buddy. I know. I know you got an award today. Gavin's mom texted me and I wasn't there. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I should have read the 50 million emails with a fine tooth comb, but I didn't read the 50 million emails. I only read one and I didn't even read it with a fine tooth comb. I didn't say all of that, but you get the point. I had to own it. It was tough. Here's the deal. I wonder today if any of you who are here or any of you who may be watching and joining us online, if you've ever felt how Landon felt in that moment, if you've ever had an expectation of a person, of your circumstances, of your life, an expectation of God, and felt disappointed, and felt let down, felt looked over, felt angry and frustrated when things didn't go the way that you wanted them to go. And so today, we are going to examine some of those expectations. We all have them. We all know what that feeling of disappointment is like. What do we do with that? And sometimes what we don't talk about are the unmet expectations we have of God. Those times when we have prayed and asked for something, we knew God would do what we were telling God he should do. And then it didn't go that way. It didn't happen the way that we thought it should go. Or we thought we knew something about God. We had been taught something about God. We grew up believing and trusting something about God, only to discover that maybe God is actually a bit different than our expectation had led us to believe. And this is going to be a very safe place for us to talk about those expectations, to, to be honest with God about how we feel about those expectations, just like the scripture writers have been honest with God over the centuries about their unmet expectations. So we are in a series on the book of Jonah. We're going to be in chapter 3 this week, looking at the expectations that we see there. But before we jump in, I want to do a little recap for those of you who may have missed a week. If you did miss a week, I highly encourage you, go back and watch what you missed. Scott has done an awesome job of making this epic, ancient story come alive in new and in fresh ways. And every week I have been either challenged or stretched or encouraged in a way that I wasn't expecting. And so as we pick up the story, what has already happened is this prophet, this man of God named Jonah, is asked by God to go to the people in the city of Nineveh, and to give them a message. Now, in this ancient epic story, everybody's doing the opposite of what we expect them to do. So Jonah, the prophet of God, says, mm -mm, I'm not going there. I don't want to go to those people. They are our enemies, and they are brutal, and they are violent, and they kill everybody around them. They oppress all of the people. I don't want to go there. Not only do I want to not go there because it's them and they're scary, but I don't want to go there, God, because I want you to judge them, not give mercy and compassion and grace to them. So Jonah runs in the opposite direction. He heads for Tarshish, where he's expecting life to be comfortable. He winds up on a ship, a storm comes, a violent storm, and the sailors throw him overboard into the depths of the ocean, and Jonah winds up as far away from God as he thinks is humanly possible. He is in the depths of the darkest sea, and it's in that moment that he gets swallowed up by a fish, and Jonah spends three days inside the fish's belly, squished by fish guts. And if you were here last week, you might have had a moment where you squirmed a little bit in your seat while Scott shared that story. And it's in that moment that Jonah cries out to God and says, okay, God, I will obey. I will do what you've asked me to do. He repents. He prays through some of the Psalms that we have. And then that chapter ends when the fish vomits Jonah up on the shore. Now, I have to tell you, after two decades of teaching and preaching sermons, I never thought I would use the word vomit on stage, but I've also never taught from the book of Jonah before. 
This story is filled with hyperbole, it is filled with satire and comedy, but it is a serious book with a serious message, and it's created that way so that it will stick in our minds, so that we will remember it. And the message, the moral of the story, is that we would learn to know and live the mercy of God. And so we're picking up the story in Jonah chapter 3, and here's what happens. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. How many of you have needed a second chance, a third chance, multiple chances? We need God to tell us again. I've even prayed before, God, will you just tell me one more time? I'm so glad it's not just me. And it's not even just normal people like me. It's legit people in the scripture who we're supposed to be learning from that need multiple chances sometimes with God. So it comes to Jonah a second time and says, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give to you. Now what's important for us to understand about the book of Jonah is that it's different from many of the other stories of prophets that we have in the scripture. And I want to tell you how it's different. So typically, when the word of the Lord comes to a prophet, and that prophet is sent to a people to proclaim the word of the Lord, we see the message, the exact message, three times. The message from God is delivered in the scripture to the prophet, usually wrapped up with, and thus saith the Lord, if it's a very traditional translation. Then we see the prophet declare the actual message verbatim to the people. And then the third time we see the people reiterate the message that the prophet has just delivered. Jonah is different because we never actually get the message directly from God that he wants to speak through the prophet Jonah. We only ever hear it from the mouth of Jonah. So he says, go to the great city, proclaim the message I give to you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. He finally goes to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going one day's journey into the city, proclaiming. Here's what he says. 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, have you ever had to do something that you really didn't want to do? Did any of you have to apologize to your spouse this weekend? I don't know what it is. I can apologize like the best of them. But if I have to apologize to my husband, Ryan, ooh, it's extra painful. And I don't know why. There's just this, this, like, I don't want to do this, but I know I'm wrong, and I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. Okay, so imagine Jonah. This is how Jonah is going into the city of Nineveh. He does not want to be there. He does not want to obey God. He is not joyfully entering the city of Nineveh to proclaim this great message. He is going begrudgingly. He's got a little bit of attitude about what he's about to say. I would imagine that Jonah did not walk into the center of the city and set up shop and proclaim a message after he had called all the people in and then explained to them what he meant by the message and then explained to them who had sent him and all of the things and then, you know, a question and answer time because surely the people are going to have questions. He didn't do any of that. He passed through the city. I don't even think he stopped. I think he walked through and and mumbled under his breath in 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. Peace out. I'm gone. But here's the thing that I love. His motives were not pure. But when are our motives ever pure as humans? And yet God uses us anyways. God takes what we can bring, what we're able to bring, what we're willing to bring in the moment, and he uses it anyways. The thing about the message as well that I I think is my favorite part of the whole story. It looks like a message of judgment, doesn't it? I mean, if you take it at face value, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. That sounds like bad news for Nineveh, doesn't it? But when you look a little closer, this is not a message of judgment. This is a message of salvation. Let me tell you why. 40 days, that is not literal that symbolizes the salvation, the redeeming work of God in the life of someone. Think of when you see the number 40 in the scripture. 40 years the Israelites wandered in the desert. 40 days 
The Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. This was a message of salvation. In 40 days, salvation is on the way. Redemption is on the way. And then when it says Nineveh will be overthrown, that word overthrown in the original Hebrew, it can be translated a few different ways. It can also be translated turned over, transformed, changed from the inside out. And so the message is not in 40 days, time's up. It's bad news. The message is in 40 days, salvation is on the way. You will be transformed. You will be changed. Two completely different messages, right? And then it says the Ninevites believed God. They trusted God. Now, another thing that's important for us to know, I just get excited about these things, so just bear with me. In the beginning, we see the Lord sent Jonah a second time. And when we see that word, the Lord, in all capital letters, it is the Hebrew name for God. It is their God. When we see the word God, G-O-D, this is a generic term for God, translated as Elohim. The Ninevites did not believe in the Hebrew God because they didn't know what God had sent Jonah. They didn't know who they were believing in or who they were trusting. They didn't have a name. Jonah left out a lot of details. But they trusted God. And so here's what happens. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. So the royals, the leaders, the people at the top of the hierarchy in the city, from them all the way down to the lowest... They all believed God, and they responded. They took action. And then when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat down in the dust. Now, what we don't know, and there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot the writer left out of the story. We want to pay attention sometimes to what is left out because that can be just as important as what is put in. When a prophet is sent to a people to declare a message They usually go directly to the king to declare the message. That doesn't happen here. We don't know how the message reached the king. I am imagining that it was a little bit like the telephone game. So Jonah walks through, mumbles the message, barely audible for the people to hear. They get kind of confused, but they're ready. And then eventually it reaches the king. And do you know what the king does that just completely catches me by surprise? He follows the lead of his people. We're going to come back to that today because that's really, really important. Then, this is the proclamation the king issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Now, if we were seated around a campfire thousands of years ago, you would be laughing hysterically. But it just kind of goes like this over our heads because we don't understand pieces of this culture. The king wants the animals dressed in sackcloth. This would be like if you went to a funeral tomorrow and you dressed up your cat. It's absurd. It's preposterous. It's something that sticks in your mind. What it's representing here is that the king and these people are desperate to do whatever they can think, whatever they can imagine, whatever they can come up with to respond to this message in a way that will get them to salvation and transformation. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways, he says, and their violence. Who knows? Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And so what's happening here is the king, who has been leading these violent and oppressive people, just assumes he has this expectation that when one of those people has a God that delivers a message to us, that God is definitely going to be angry. Because we have not treated those people well. We haven't even treated ourselves well. And so we see the king reveal what he's wrestling with, his perception of God. And then it says, when God saw 
what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. So what we're seeing here is these people responding to the way they think God is at work in their life, the way they think God is at work in their community, in their people group. Sometimes we get this right and sometimes we get this wrong. But today what we want to do is we want to consider in the story, and my prayer has been for you this week, that as you hear this story, the Spirit of God would speak to you about who you relate to. Can you see yourself in Jonah and in some of his expectations? Can you see yourself in the people of Nineveh and in their expectations? Or can you see yourself in the king and some of his expectations? There's no right or wrong answer. In fact, as I reflect on my own life, there have been seasons and times when I can relate to Jonah, seasons and times when I feel more like the people of Nineveh, and seasons and times when I can relate more to the king. So I want us to look at those today. You see, Jonah wanted judgment and expected mercy. So he responded with resentment. Jonah wanted judgment for the people of Nineveh. He wanted them to get what they had coming to them. He wanted them to be paid back for the way that they had behaved and the way that they had treated not only the Hebrew people, but the people around them. He wanted judgment, but what Jonah had come to know about God is that God is patient and kind and merciful and loving, and so he expected God would be merciful to the people, which is why he ran in the opposite direction the first time around. So he wanted judgment, expected mercy, and responded with resentment. Do you know that feeling of resentment, that icky feeling that we have? It's tied to envy. It's this feeling of anger or frustration or judgment that we have when somebody else has something that we think should be ours or that they don't deserve. And we can feel resentment for all kinds of different people in our lives. We can feel resentment for our coworker because they don't work nearly as hard as we do. They're not nearly as gifted as we are, but they seem to get all of the raises and promotions and all of the stuff. And my boss never tells me how great I am. And so I have this feeling of resentment towards them. We can feel resentment towards our spouse because of the way that things have been delegated and divvied up in the home, and somehow it always feels like I wind up doing more, and I wind up doing more of your share of the responsibility, and so I feel resentment towards my spouse. We can feel resentment towards our adult siblings. We've checked all the boxes in life. We've done all the right things. We've never made massive mistakes and royally messed up our life. But they can't seem to stop doing all that stuff, and yet they get all the time and all the attention and all the support, mom and dad. We can even feel resentment sometimes for our kids. This one's hard. If you're someone who has worked really hard to give your kids or your grandkids the kind of life that you never imagined you could have, opportunities that you never had access to, and then you watch them take them for granted, Sometimes that feeling of resentment can bubble up inside of us. What we're seeing in Jonah here is resentment. Resentment towards God, resentment towards the people of Nineveh. And I wonder if maybe you can relate to that today. I know there are multiple times a week when I feel that feeling. One of my favorite authors is Brene Brown, and she wrote a great book recently on emotions, and resentment was one of the ones that she wrote about. And in the book, she gives us a question to ask when we feel this feeling of resentment that I think is a powerful question. So what I did was I took the question, and I added a little something of my own to it, and I, and I want to share it with you today. The question is, when I feel this feeling of resentment, what do I need that I am not willing to acknowledge or ask for? What do I need? Do I need rest? Do I need help? Do I need connection and relationship? Do I need a little bit of time and support? What do I need? And I'm not willing to acknowledge it because I don't want to feel needy. 
I want to feel like I got it all together. I want to feel like I don't need somebody's help. I don't, Chris, I don't want to ask them for what I need. They should just know what I need and read my mind. We want it to work that way, but it doesn't work that way. We feel vulnerable when we are not willing to acknowledge something that we need. And it's hard to ask for it. And so today, maybe the invitation for you is to acknowledge what you need and what you haven't wanted to ask for and to take that to God, to take that to your spouse, to take that to a friend, to take that into a relationship that you trust. And then in the people of Nineveh, we see they had their own expectations. You see, the people expected to stay stuck in the same, and yet they responded with surrender. They expected to stay stuck in cycles of violence and oppression and abuse. When there's generations of that, it is really, really difficult to break the cycles, the patterns. They expected that nothing would ever change for them. And I think they all had lots of excuses about whose fault it all was. Just like you and I have lots of excuses about our own stuff and our own life. And yet we see they responded with surrender. And what I mean by surrender is we see them begin to fast. And they put on sackcloth. Now, a lot of us, myself included, there were many, many years when I was like, fast? I mean, I know we're supposed to do it because the people of God did it for thousands of years, but I don't really know why I'm fasting or what I'm supposed to be fasting or what this is supposed to do. I just know it makes me hangry. Have any of you ever been hangry fasters before? And then you finish and you're like, why was I even doing that? Yep, thank you. I see at least one person's being honest with me this morning. And so one of the commentators that I read, I thought captured it for me in a way that I could understand. This commentator said that when we fast, we are praying with our body, that we empty ourselves because we're desperate to be filled with God, that it is an inaudible prayer. And you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of when the Apostle Paul writes about when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit prays for us in inaudible sighs and groans. The people of Nineveh didn't know who to pray to because Jonah didn't tell them. They didn't know what to pray because Jonah didn't tell them. They didn't have an A plus B equals forgiveness and salvation. They just didn't know, and so they did what they knew they might be able to do, which is to fast. And then they put on sackcloth, which is what we do when we're mourning, if you're a part of this culture. And it represents a letting go of what's comfortable leaving behind what's familiar and what we're used to and what makes us feel comfortable and we put on something itchy and uncomfortable and un just ew, get it off. They were surrendering in the best way that they knew how. So they got this picture of what was possible. In 40 days, you will be turned over. In 40 days, salvation is on its way. Change is possible. Transformation is possible. That sparked a desire for change in them, which we see in the fasting. And then they surrendered, which we see when they put on the sackcloth. And so my question for you today, if you can relate to the people of Nineveh, where do you feel stuck? Where in your life and in your story do you feel stuck in the same trapped by habits and patterns and cycles, maybe that have been present in your life and in your family for generations and you're not sure it's possible to get out. Maybe you have said things like, this is how I have always been. This is just who I am. This is just how we did things. This is just how my family did things. And the message that God has for you today is in 40 days, you will be turned over. Now, don't pull out your phone and count 40 days from now and mark it on your calendar because remember, this is not literal 40 days. It symbolizes the salvation of God at work in our life. Here's what I know about transformation. It is possible. And I know this because I have seen it in my own life time and time again. My life does not make sense on paper. God is responsible for everything good in my life and he has redeemed so much that I do not deserve. And in addition to that, he continues that work in my life. And because of the work that I get to do, 
as one of your pastors, I get to see the transforming work of God in your lives and in the lives of others. And so I know it's possible, but here's the other thing that I know about transformation. And it's the thing that we don't really like about transformation. It usually takes longer than we want it to. It just does. It usually takes longer than we want it to, and it often doesn't look the way that we think it should look. And then sometimes what happens is God says, not now. And we see this in the life of the Apostle Paul when he shares with us that he prayed three times for that thorn in his side to be removed. And we never got to know what the thorn in his side was. But we know that the Apostle Paul had an expectation that when he prayed and asked God to remove the thorn from his side, that God would actually answer the prayer and do the thing. But what we see is God responds to the Apostle Paul and he says, no, essentially, My grace is sufficient for your need. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so even when the answer is not now or not yet or no, we see that God is still with us and that there's goodness that comes from whatever that thorn is. And so can you relate to the people of Nineveh today if you are desiring transformation? I want you to know that you need community. You need people. I don't know that I can tell you a story of that happening in someone's life who flew solo and did it all by their self. We need people. You need us. And we want to be that community for you. And one of the best places for you to do that is in our Celebrate Recovery ministry. They meet on Thursday nights, and this is a community of men and women who have experienced a hurt, a habit, or a hang-up And they're ready to welcome you just as you are, where you are, and walk with you through the salvation work of God, the redeeming work of God in your life. No strings attached. It is an incredibly safe and loving community of people. And so maybe what God is inviting you to do is to join that community. In 40 days, you will be turned over. And then finally, we see that the king expected God to be angry, and yet he responded with humility. He expected God to be angry, and he humbled himself. He came down off of his throne, which kings never do. He took off his robes and his mantle, which kept him separate from the people, and the mantle actually represented his right to speak on behalf of God, and the king is going, I don't have any right to speak for God. I don't. I don't know, I'm, I'm carrying the weight of this responsibility. And then the king joins the people, follows the people. He sits down in ashes. He leaves behind everything that was comfortable and everything that kept him separate. And he joins in with his people. He admits that he doesn't know what's next or what God is going to do or how all of this is gonna turn out. And I know that there are some of you in here today who are carrying the weight of leadership. And it can be a heavy weight. And that can look like lots of different things. It can be managing a team of people, running an organization, leading a classroom, leading your own children, leading a sports team that you coach of kids. But it's a heavy responsibility. What would it look like to follow in the footsteps of this king who's doing the opposite of what we would have expected and to live this out with humility. You know, oftentimes we too are afraid that God is angry with us. And so we hold on to the titles and the accolades and the stuff that makes us feel better because if we were to peel back the layers and get to the bottom, of what's underneath, we're afraid that God would be angry about what he sees, angry at our motives, angry at where we fall short. I don't know, maybe you're here today and you have an expectation that I gotta keep God at a distance, I can't really let him see me and know me because if he really saw me and really knew me, I think he would probably be angry. What the king found, though, was that God is compassionate even to the leader who carries a big chunk of the responsibility and the weight. 
There's a parallel here to the story of the prodigal son that Jesus shares with us, the parable that Jesus shares with us. And a parable in the New Testament is a story that didn't really happen, that Jesus shares to help us understand a truth about who God is and how he operates in the world. And in the story, we see a son go to his father, and in the story, what happens is the son says to the father, I want my inheritance now. Give me what's coming to me, which in that culture would have essentially been the son saying to the dad, I just want you dead. Can you just die and be done now so that I can get what's coming to me? Incredible disrespect. Painful. The son leaves, goes, squanders the inheritance, hits rock bottom, winds up not even having enough food to eat, and in that moment considers, would I be able to maybe go home? And as you see him start to consider that possibility, the son is wondering, I, I know, Dad, I know the father is going to be angry with me because of what I've done, because how could he not be angry with me because of what I've done? But maybe he will allow me to be a servant. Maybe he will allow me to just be a servant in his household because he's going to treat his servants better than I'm getting treated here. And so he makes the choice to go home, even if the father was going to be angry. And what we see happen is while the son was still a long ways off, the father sees him, sees him coming. And Jesus tells us that the father pulls up the robe, the skirts of the robe, and runs to meet his son. Now, again, this does not happen in Hebrew culture. Men do not run because it is undignified. But this father didn't care. This father just knew their kid was coming home. So they run out, meets the son, son tries to apologize, tries to tell the father that he's going to do things different, and the father says, no, 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 there's no time for that. I want to welcome you home, I want to care for you, I want to comfort you, I want to celebrate you. This is a picture, not of a God who's angry, but of a God who is compassionate. Compassionate towards us. And so of those three stories, I wonder which one you can relate to. And so as the team comes out, they're going to lead us in a final song. And I love the lyrics to this song because it causes us to wonder if maybe we've thought something about God that actually isn't true. That maybe we have believed or trusted something about God and what if God is actually different and better than what we expected. This song addresses our expectations, and so as they lead us, my invitation to you is to just take a moment, and I want you to reflect and ask God, can you see yourself more in Jonah in this story? Is there some resentment that it's time to deal with? And remember that God was compassionate towards Jonah too. Can you see yourself more in the story of the people of Nineveh? Or can you see yourself more in the story of the king?